Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of To The Point Podcast. Hope you guys all had a great weekend. Um, I know I did watching um, some great hockey action over the weekend, um, including uh, the Leafs game Saturday night, uh, then playing the Senators. Also, a really uh, intriguing team is the Vegas Golden Knights to me. They won their second in a row over the weekend. And also a team that I think uh, I have finishing second in the North Division, but I think has played the best hockey. Um, they've only played two games, but is the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, they've really stood out to me early on in the season. Um, we're going to get into all of it today. Uh, today's podcast, gonna, I'm going to be talking basically NBA, NHL, and the, and the NFL uh, throughout this podcast. It's something I'm going to be doing more and more. Um, just with sports coming back, you know, there's so much content right now. Um, I'm still going to be doing, you know, individual sports where I have uh, panelists and things like that. So um, keep your uh, eyes and ears out for that. But for my... Um, Solo updates. I kind of want to keep you guys up to date with everything that's going on, um, especially over the weekend. I mean, there's so much content when you come in on a Monday. So um, usually Mondays expect to hear about NFL, hear about NHL, NBA, um, baseball as it gets going, maybe even um, the UFC if you're interested in that. So, um, but yeah, like I said, a good hockey over the weekend. Then obviously yesterday, uh, my primary focus was on um, the Rams. Uh, sorry, the NFL. I saw two NFL games. Saturday, Rams, Packers, and Ravens, uh, Bills. And then yesterday with the, the two matchups between, uh, sorry, between the Browns and Chiefs and uh, the Saints and Bucks. So we're going to go through it all today. And we'll start, sat, we'll start with the NFL. Um, just off the top, um, the Saints, we're, I'm going to go through the game. They, they lost last night. So after that, they're, once you're eliminated from playoff contention, every coach in your roster is free to explore different options. So one of their coaches, he's been an offensive line coach. Um, he was in Miami a few years ago. He's actually fired for doing, <laughs> using, doing cocaine before, for an interview. And of course, um, the, the the Detroit Lions hired him as their head coach. Uh, that's what Adam Schefter said it's going to happen. They're still working out the fine details, but it's basically set in stone. No, I'm not saying that this is a bad hire. Um, everybody deserves a second chance in life. I, I believe in that. Um, and, you know, he could be great in Detroit, but it, it's just Detroit to me. Uh, you know, there's some really good people available. Um, two that top of my mind are Brian Dayball, the offensive coordinator for the Buffalo Bills, and Eric Bieniemy, the offensive coordinator for the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, with the hirings, you know, Urban Meyer has been hired. I mentioned just Dan Campbell for the Lions. We got... Um, Robert Sala, who was happy to see get a job with the Jets um, last night. The Chargers announced that they're hiring Brandon Staley, the um, defensive coordinator for, for the former defensive coordinator for the Rams. So these jobs are quickly going away. Uh, Chargers hired Staley. You know, it's just, and the Lions hiring Dan Campbell, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't resonate with me. Um, I don't get it entirely. The Atlanta Falcons. So there, there's there been seven openings. Five of them are filled. There's two jobs left. The Eagles job and the Houston job. Um, before we get into that, just the Lions. Maybe he'll be a great hire, but it's not. Uh, I just don't like it. Um, it seems like a lateral move again where the Detroit Lions – you know, there's jobs that are worse in Detroit right now. The Houston job, Adam Schefter reported, it's basically nobody wants to touch it because of their ownership situation. And Detroit's not much better because you got two Fords running the operation there. And that's bias on my part, I'll admit. I hate Ford, always will. But Dan Campbell, that, I mean, yeah, just... It's just a tough hire for me. You know, there's two jobs left, and I this I have to say this: if Eric Bieniemy does not get a head and co head coaching job, and I'm 100% serious, the NFL should find themselves for racism. He's won a Super Bowl. He brought a backup quarterback yesterday and won a game, and this guy can't get a job. He's the offensive coordinator for the Kansas City Chiefs under Andy Reid with Patrick Mahomes. And they've been dominating the league for three years. And he can't get a job. He can't get a head coaching job. But you ha yet you hired Dan Campbell, who was caught on Campbell doing cocaine. 
Like Eric Bieniemy has no spots, nothing, no bad, nothing. Except the only difference between Dan Campbell and Eric Bieniemy is that one's black and one's white. And everybody can play this off like it's not a big deal and it's just, oh, it's bullshit is what it is because they what they do in the NFL is there's something that's called the Rooney Rule. It was set up by the Pittsburgh Steelers and their ownership who actually have good ownership. They hired Mike Tomlin, who was a nobody who nobody thought they would hire after Coach Cower stepped down. And he's never missed the playoffs as an Afri- African-American head coach. And I'm not saying every black coach is going to be great, but you can hire one. It, the enemy, he might have to take the Houston job after they didn't even want to friggin' interview him because Deshaun Watson said, please interview Eric Benemy. I want him as my head coach. They were the only team out of the seven openings that didn't request an interview with him. The only one with a black African American, an African American quarterback. And it just bothers me that it's just swept under the rug year after year where these guys who get head coaching opportunities like Matt Patricia, they get these head in Detroit a couple years ago when you have good African-American candidates that just get interviewed, but it's, it's like, okay, well, we have to interview. It's a rule. You have to at least interview one minority candidate. So they do it. And then they say, oh, well, they just throw out that paper. It's a joke. The system has to change. We're trying to, evolve as a world the NFL has to do the same thing and people don't like to talk about race I'm not afraid to talk about it this whole Black Lives Matters movement I've been on board with it since day one I've had better conversations with my parents and people in my life about it than we ever have because it makes us think and seeing this I'm not going to have my platform and not bring it up because something needs to change about it and yes, he might get the Eagles job. He might have to take the Houston job. But if I'm Eric Bieniemy and the only job left is Houston and they didn't even want to interview me, I tell them to kick rocks. I'm not taking it. That might be spiteful. And that's, that's I go back to Kansas City and I, I coach under Andy Reid where at least I know I'm appreciated. I'm not going to Houston where they have those owners that a couple of years ago said, we can't let the inmates run the asylum. Hell No. Maybe he'll take the Eagles job, which isn't, I wouldn't want that one either. Cause it's a mess there. They got no cap space. Got Carson Wentz. Who's sh- just shaking. They want to keep him, And he's looked like a different person this year, but it's, it's unfortunate because I think Brian Dayball will get one of the other two jobs if he wants it. So there's one gone and it's just a, uh, it's unfortunate. Um, get passionate this morning, but it just bothers me that he might not get the opportunity that, that he deserves. Um, so yeah, Dan Campbell hired Brent, uh, Dan Campbell hired by Detroit Lions, Brandon Staley for defensive coordinator for the Rams hired by the chargers last night, according to Adam Schefter. So this weekend's game we'll pivot here Four matchups. Like I said, the first one of the weekend Rams at Packers, um, this was, for me coming in, this was the easiest game to predict. Um, I didn't think the Rams had much of a chance coming in. Just you know, Jared Goff with his injuries, you had them going to a, a cold weather climate. I didn't think that they had great odds at winning winning this game. But um, you know, I give the Rams credit in this game. They they came out and played hard. Uh, it didn't. I don't think it helped. You know, it helped their case that Aaron Rodgers. Played fair to me, no better than fair. Um, I saw after the game, a lot of people were praising his performance. I thought skill zero to hundred, I give him a 60 passing grade. That's it. Missed a lot of wide open receivers. Didn't really get that much pressure in his face, still under throwing guys. And uh, so, yeah, but Green Bay wins the game 32 to 18. But, you know, he, we saw, we saw him one thing for Green Bay that really st- stuck out to me is the red zone. You know, they've been the top team in the red zone this whole year. They struggled. Two different times they go down the red zone, they end up in field goals. You need to score. You know, he, um, we saw the, the Rams shot, 
So back for first drive, Packers field goal. The Rams get a good drive going. Jared Goss throwing the ball on play action. They're getting that wide open. They get down to the Green Bay 15. Fourth and one, they're going to gamble, but they go false start, goes back five yards. They got to settle for a field goal. But the real f- emphasis on this game, and really the reason I think the Packers won the game, was their offensive line in their run game. Um, A.J. Dillon and Aaron Jones both had great games. They were getting big holes from their offensive linemen, you know, Elton Jenkins, uh, Corey Lindsley in the middle. These guys were working hard to give these guys gaping holes. And they, they chewed up the Rams' defense. Um, Aaron Donald had a tough day. Uh, he was coming in, like I said, with some rib injuries, and it showed. He couldn't play half the snaps. Um, he was obviously in pain because he was getting double teamed a lot of the day, too. And he just had this, didn't have the same burst that you normally see from, you know, one of the best players in the NFL. But um, we see the, the Green Bay goes down, goes down the field. They're going play action. They're, they're running the ball a ton. They have a 13 play drive, eight minutes, 13 running plays, 10 pass, so a good mix. It ends up with uh, Aaron Rodgers throwing a quick screen to Devontae Adams for one yard touchdown reception. Um, and this really started uh, a, something for me where we saw Aaron Rodgers really, he, he took what the defense gave him. And Jalen Ramsey, who's one of the better corners in the NFL, he had a tough day. He couldn't cover Devontae Adams, and at times he didn't just blanket him. Um, I think it was imperative that he stick, you know, stick with Devontae Adams the whole day. Do not go to uh, Mar- Marcus Valdez-Scantling. Do not switch on to Alan Lazard. He should have been on him all day, every play, slot. I don't care. You pay him that kind of money, you got to do it. And he just didn't. Um, and Devontae Adams was chewing him up. He was caught a few times on Robert Tanyan. That wasn't a great matchup for him. But um, – Green Bay, their defense came to play too. Uh, they got some sacks. Preston Smith ended the game with two sacks. Um, Kenny Clark had two sacks. They sacked Jared Goff four times. And on the next Rams drive, they get a sack on third down, three and out. And Aaron Rodgers goes on a touchdown drive, ends it with a two-yard touchdown rush, 16 to three Green Bay. Um, uh, and then, you know, the Rams, all year, they haven't really been the best team to me. I think they have all the all the makings of a Super Bowl contender and they get to the divisional playoff game, which kudos to them. Uh, and they, they kind of showed why two minute warning. They, they ran their offense. Well, two minute drill, um, eight play drive. Cam Akers really dominated the drive, running the football, catching screens out of the backfield. He, he's, he had two great playoff games this postseason, and it, it capped off with a seven yard touchdown pass and Jared Goff to Van Jefferson, 16, 10 at the half. So this was big, you know, uh, Mason Crosby, during this half, Mason Crosby and the holder, J.K. Scott, messed up on an extra point, and then they went for two, and they didn't convert. So the Rams were right in it. Um, Rodgers starts off, starts uh, the next half, field goal drive, 19-10, and then start their next possession. I mean, it was an Aaron Jones show. First play, 60-yard run, just gaping hole, runs down the field, tackled. Six plays, 76 yards. Aaron Jones had um, 70 of the yards. And again, failed two-point conversion throughout 25-10, Green Bay. Um, it got close a little bit. Cam Akers got a seven-yard touchdown rush. But Green Bay's defense came to play. Uh, Aaron Rodgers threw a, a beautiful deep ball to Alan Lazard. So he finished the game with a couple of touchdown passes. She was 23 for 36, 296, two touchdowns and a rush touchdown. But again, I didn't, he wasn't that accurate. He didn't play that great and he wasn't playing a great team. You know, if of all the teams they could have played this weekend, the Packers had the best matchup of any, if you look AFC, NFC in my mind, it didn't matter. Uh, I'd rather play the, I'd rather play the Rams over the Browns or, you know, any of the other, you know, teams that are, are at home. I think they had the easiest matchup. But nevertheless, you know, Green Bay gets the win. Uh, it was good to see the running game start to come out again. I think that, that could be key. Um, I'm not going to see what they're going to play yet. We'll get through, get to there. But in next week's divisional, uh, sorry, championship game, I think the run game is going to be important uh, and see if they can take a little pressure off Rodgers. And they're going to be at home. Uh, the NFC 
chip game is going to be in it at Lambeau Field. Um, and early forecast is we might get some snow in that game. It's going to be cold as usual. So it plays to the strength of Green Bay. They're used to that, and they'll be prepared and ready for whatever kind of weather comes their way. Second game of Saturday night's game, we got Ravens at Bills. And coming in, I was going to pick – my head said pick the Ravens. Um but I've been on the Bills all year. I've been kind of on their bandwagon all year. So I didn't want to turn coat on that. So I said, you know what? I'm taking the Bills out of spite just for that. And it paid off for me. Um, but really, the first, the first half was such craziness to me because the Ravens should have won the game in the first half. They really should have. They start the game on a, just an incredible drive. I mean, they were on a 12-play 12 play drive, 10 rushes. I mean, Lamar's only threw for six yards in the drive. He's running the ball. Gus Edwards getting good yards. J.K. Dobbins, they went to Marquise Brown in the backfield. They're being really creative. And they're driving the ball down the field. But Lamar makes one big mistake. It's on second down. He holds the ball. He, it's a run pass option. He's trying to fake to the left, holds the ball, and he sees corner Levi Wallace blitzed. Beautiful blitz from him. But Lamar, he has to have quarterback instinct. You have to throw the ball away. Because you have field position, but he thinks he can get away from Wallace, which I understand Lamar's really you know gifted and he's quick. Levi Wallace didn't bite, huge sack, and they lose, they lose 18 yards on the play. And it was it was such a bad thing because then they got they get a few yards back on third down, but it brought them still they're still in field position, but again, to just to talk about Buffalo. That Buffalo Saturday night, the winds were crazy. You know, Josh Allen was throwing deep balls. The ball, it would go like this, and then it would go here. You know, it was it was frantic all game where the ball, the, the wind was really a huge factor in the game. So they get out there, 41-yard field goal, Justin Tucker. He's the most accurate kicker in the history of the NFL. 41 yards, of course, he misses it. Seven-minute drive to start the game, and they don't come away with points. That's half the quarter, and it hurts the defense. But again, you need to score there. Two key mi- mistakes: Lamar get the ball, throw the ball away. Let the play another down. You get good field position. Then it's second and ten. You have two more plays. You're running the ball well. No big deal. And Justin Tucker, it's tough, but you got to make that field goal. Kickers, that's your one job. And it, you stink in the game. Well, that was your one job, and you had a pretty pretty brutal game. So. So that starts a hit drive. Then Buffalo gets the ball, but they get one first down, then a stop. Drive was just over a minute, so they don't get their defense time to rest. If the defense on the field for seven minutes, 24 seconds, they need to come right back out. Um, thankfully, Buffalo's defense, they have one of their best games of the year, I, I think. They get a three and out, um, and, you know, they – they let Baltimore get rushing yards, but they didn't let them get huge chunk plays. They didn't let Lamar break out of the pocket. And that was the key. Uh, the next punt, they're in, you know, Baltimore's at their own uh, 15 on the play. Sam Coke, 15 year punter, one of the best in the game. He muffs it, just shanks it. And they get Buffalo gets the ball at the Baltimore 38. Um, they don't get much out of it. Um, they, Gabriel Davis had a touchdown in the end zone, dropped it. They settled for a Tyler Bass 28-yard field goal. And it's 3 nothing, 3 nothing. um, sorry, 3 nothing Buffalo. Baltimore again, 3 and out. But to start the game, first 17 plays, 13 rushes, four passes. Um, then Buffalo again, they go on a decent drive, but another key thing, Tyler Bass, 43-yard field goal, misses it. He hasn't been a great kicker all year, but in the conditions, four. Anything really from above 30, 35 was not going to go in tonight. Um, then Baltimore obviously gets gets the ball back. They make a big big play to J.K. Dobbins, the screen in the backfield. Um, and they get the ball down the field. And again, the way the game's going, there's no points being scored. So points right now are at a premium. And Justin Tucker misses 46 yard field goal. Second miss of the half. This he's the most accurate kicker in the history of the NFL. 
two misses, and it's just deflating. You can see the Baltimore under Sean Harbaugh just dipped his head, and, and it's something. But Josh Allen wasn't playing great. Like I said, the Bills didn't have a lot going. They had good field position, so they got points just because because they had good field position. Um, but they get he gets strip sacked. Um, luckily, they, they recover. But Baltimore gets the ball back. To start the game, Josh Allen's 0 for 3 on deep balls. He's throwing it a lot. And like I said, the wind's carrying it. It's not even close. He's not having this great game. Um, but, you know, he's, they, they get before the half. They, Buffalo punts the ball, minute 14 left. Then you see Baltimore, they go down the field, 39-yard field goal. Tucker finally messes, makes one at the beginning of the half. But a key, key thing to point out here, in the first half, Baltimore had three, uh, sorry, Buffalo had three tackles for loss on Lamar and a sack. That's unheard of. I mean, he does a lot of run pass option where he can give it to the back, keep it himself. They were reading it. Matt Milano was breaking them up. He was their re- corner blitzes. They had a scheme prepared for Lamar Jackson and it was working. But Baltimore, the reason I say they should have won the game in the first half, the way the game was going, they had three. That's nine three at the half. And the rest of the game, Buffalo, Buffalo did nothing in that first half. They got points only because of a muff punt. Otherwise, they never even got close to scoring. And just stu- key mistakes by the Baltimore Ravens cost them and, and it continued in the second half. Buffalo got their one drive of the game to start the second half. It was their one drive where they're really effective. They go down the field and what, the, what Buffalo did – um, they weren't running the ball. First half, they had two rushing plays, 22 pass plays from Josh Allen. They switched it up a bit. Um, they're still, they ran start to second half. They had an 11 play drive, five rush, six pass, ends with a touchdown from Allen to Stefan Diggs, who had another 100 yard receiving day. He's, he's having a big year, probably the best receiver in the NFL. So 10 3. But Baltimore, they've been having, like I said, they've been the better team. They've been having better drives, but this was the part of the game where it killed them. Um, they respond with a fantastic 15 plays, 66 yards, eight minutes, 48 seconds of the clock, so almost the whole third quarter. Um, good mix of run pass. Um, balls on the Buffalo seven, third and goal. Lamar throws a pass in the, in the end zone uh, looking for Mark Andrews. Taron Johnson, he's kind of playing underneath that he doesn't see him, pops in the screen. Picks it up, end zone, end zone interception. He doesn't go down. He takes off with it, returns it 101 yards for a touchdown. Tied for the longest pick six in postseason history. 17-3. After eight minutes, almost eight and a half minutes, third and goal, they're right there, but a pick, and he takes it all the way back to the house. 17-3 then, and that was really... That was really ball game. Uh, Lamar, they got the ball back, but with eight minutes left in the uh, in the fourth quarter, Lamar was uh, concussed. He could not return to the game. Tyler Huntley had to come in. We saw some drop passes from um, receive for key receivers for the Ravens, but the Bills didn't do a lot um, on offense. But they had one good drive. Their defense stepped up in a big way, and they advanced to the AFC Championship game. Um, Paul, like I said Baltimore should have had the game. I, I think. They had it in their, in their grasp, but you know, Buffalo credit to them. They've been great all year. That's why I've been, you know, pumping their tires and they came to play. Um, And they get the win at home. The bills mafia was going crazy. And um, they play the winner of the Browns chiefs, which is oddly enough, the next game on the schedule. Um, Coming in, I, I picked the chiefs. However, I, probably was the least confident person about the chiefs that anybody I know. Um, he, he wasn't, I didn't think Mahomes was playing that great down the stretch. They let teams hang around in games. They didn't play with a lot of fervor and I was interested to see how they come out, but to start the game, their offense was playing better than I think they have all year. Their opening drive touchdown, just fantastic. They're running the ball. A uh, Daryl Williams, who, Clyde Edwards Hilaire, their starting running back was out. Sammy Watkins, one of their top receivers, was out for the game. But they're going to Daryl Williams. He's running the ball effectively. Uh, Mahomes uh key uh key pass to Tariq Hill for 26 yards. He ran for two first downs. And 
it ends up with a Patrick Mahomes one yard touchdown rush, six nothing after a mixed missed yeah, missed extra point. Um, but you make uh, Browns get the ball, good drive, eleven plays. Uh, Mayfield throwing the ball around, they're giving it to Nick Chubb, but ends up just with a field goal. Cody Parkey forty six yards, six three. Chiefs, Chiefs just they you know Mahomes is going to different guys on different drives. This play, this drive was all about Mikal Hardman. He had a 41 yard uh, catch and run. It was like a push pass uh, on a, a jet sweep. He went 41 yards. He had two other catches for first downs on the drive. And it concluded with um, Patrick Mahomes throwing it to Travis Kelsey for 20 yard touchdown, 13 to three. But f- frustrating half for, for Baker Mayfield. Um, Throw into Nick Chubb twice. He had two drops on the, on the same drive. They had to punt a lot. Uh, Mahomes, they go on another big drive. Kansas City did points in every drive but one in the first half. They go down to Cleveland 27, um, but they couldn't complete a pass, 16-3. So 16-3, but Browns get the ball back before, before halftime. So I was thinking, well, okay, they got the ball here, two-minute warning. They get some points. They get the ball to start the second half. We, we still got a ball game here. And it was going. They were chugging the football down the field. Mayfield's really going to uh, David Njoku, had a big first half. He had three catches. He also was um, finding uh, Donovan Peoples-Jones, Jarvis Landry contributing, uh, contributing. And with 27 seconds, he threw a, a dime to um, Rashard Higgins. And Rashard Higgins makes the catch at about the five. He's running towards the pylon. But Daniel Sorensen, keen play, gets in there with his shoulder. He kind of led with his head. It's true, but he let, leaves with his head. They kind of make head-to-head contact. The ball comes out of Rashard Higgins' hands, rolls through the end zone, and out. So what happens there is if the ball comes out before it crosses the pylon and it rolls through the end zone, it's called a touchback. And Kansas City gets the ball at the 25. So it's a turnover. It's a turnover on downs. For Cleveland, they were literally inches away from scoring. And Higgins, you know, on the telecast, they're kind of talking about how the hit's kind of illegal. I get it, but if you don't let the defender do that, then defense can't play defense. I mean, that was his only option there to stop them from scoring. I was fine with the no call. Sorensen just made a better play, in my opinion. Higgins let it go roll through, and it was really demoralizing for the Browns. I mean, they had such an opportunity. And of course, before for the half, Mahomes drives down the field. Harrison Bucker, 28-yard field goal, 19 to 3 at the half. Just a real killer for, for the Browns and tough. Um, but they respond with a big play. Um, you see uh, the start, you get an uh, interception from um, 20 seconds in the third quarter. Uh, Honey Badger, Tyron Matthew, who was really the MVP of this game, in my opinion, what, made an interception, so they, they get a field goal. Um, but, you know, the Browns, you know, they weren't shaken. They responded. You got 22-3 at this point. You get a big touchdown to to Jarvis Landry, four-yard score. Uh, however, next drive, this is really the turning point of the game. Chiefs drive, pick up two first downs. They're going well. Third one, Mahomes decides to carry the football. Um, and he he's diving for, for the first down. He gets kind of wrapped up and his head gets wrenched. His neck gets wrenched back a little bit. His head hits the ground. He gets up and he's just wobbly. You know, he, he can't support himself. It was a pretty scary scene for him. And of course, he has to go back to the blue tent and go into concussion protocol. So Chad Henney has to come into the game. And it's third third inches. They decide to go for it. A fourth and inches or they decide to go for it. They get the first down. And we see uh, runs the ball well. And they end up getting a field goal. So 22-10 at this point. But then the Browns, just a gutsy, gutsy drive. 18 plays, 75 yards. They go two for two on fourth down on the drive. They're three for three on the day. Baker Mayfield's making some big throws to, to receivers. He had a fantastic game. He had that pick. But other than that, he was he was balling yesterday. Kareem Hunt started to get involved after he only had one touch in the first half. Nick Chubb was running the ball effectively. And it ends with the Austin Hooper fourth down catch. He, 
Austin Hooper made a fourth down catch on the drive. Great catch. We want to go back and look at that one. But Kareem Hunt ran it in four yard score, 22 17. Browns in it. Start the fourth quarter. Except Chad Henney, he had to come in. He's a 13 year vet in the league. He's 35. Formerly the Miami Dolphins. Obviously not prepped for this situation. And he was going well. He made some good throws on a, on a third down to Travis Kelsey. But next play, I don't know what he was looking at, but he threw a ball. Daryl Williams, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Demarcus Robinson was the only receiver down the field, but he was in double coverage. He air mails him, picked off in the end zone, turnover with eight minutes left. And I thought this might be it because I don't trust Henny to score. In eight minutes, the Kansas State defense was playing okay, but it was tough. Um, and it gave the Browns a, a lot of momentum. Eight minutes left. Like I said, they're three for three on fourth down. They're playing gutsy all day. Stefanski was not afraid to take chances. But they, Kansas City's defense makes a big stop. They get a tackle for loss, and Baker Mayfield throws an incomplete pass. Then throws a, a little dump off pass. And they're forced to punt four or seven to go. They're stuck deep in their territory. And I agreed with the punt. It's four or seven to go, but their defense is playing well. They got timeouts. Chad, Chad Henney's at quarterback. You take that chance. You punt the ball back, you get you get it back, and you score a touchdown, you win. You're down five. But this is where the hashtag started coming on Twitter. Anything is possible from Patrick Mahomes himself. They're going down the field. They're getting for they get a couple first downs, but they need one more to clinch the victory. And on a third and 13, Henny takes off 35, you know, just chugging along. He's scrambling, dies for the first down, takes a hit. He's a half an inch short of the first down. So this is it. Two minute warning. Browns are out of timeouts. It's fourth and inches. Chiefs had two timeouts. So if you get the first down, the game is over. But it's fourth and inches. If, if you don't convert, Browns get the ball at midfield with two minutes. That's not good either. So coming out of the two minute warning, it seems like Kansas City is going to make try to draw Cleveland offside. If they don't jump, they'll just call a timeout and then they'll call a play. Um, you know, after the after the thirty second timeout, but. Of course, Andy Reid, he's got the biggest balls in the NFL. He runs a little <laughs> up and go or Tyree kills in the backfield, fakes like he's going deep, goes back in, throws it to Hill. He scrambles, first down, ball game. Gutsy, gutsy play because you're relying on a backup quarterback to, one, know the play, make the throw, and for Tyree Kill to make the catch. They've ran this play actually already this year when they beat the Bucs. They had to ice the game. They needed. They used this play. Same thing with Tyree Kill, and it worked. They used it again today. Sorry, yesterday, and that was it. They could melt the clock, but Chad Henney comes in relief. Anything is possible. The Kansas City Chiefs move on to their third straight AFC Championship game. This will be the first time in, in AFC history that um, a team will host the AFC Championship game for the third year in a row. Obviously, the big question now: great season for the Browns, but. Patrick Mahomes, what's, is he going to be healthy enough to play? Um, it's a concussion. He's going to have to pass protocols. It's not like it's a, it's not like it's a glute and you can tough it out. You know, if he's got a concussion, he's not going to be playing. So big decisions over Kansas city, but Chad Henney, good on you. You, it's like being a backup goalie. That's how I kind of tried to explain it to people. You don't know when you're coming in, but you have to be ready. He had to know the play. He had to, he made a bad pick, but he had that opportunity to, to bounce back from it, and he did. That scramble took a lot of guts, and good on Eric Bieniemy, good on Andy Reid for having the balls to call that play and get their team back to the AFC Championship game. But I think it was the best game of the weekend for me. Uh, it was thoroughly entertaining. It was a really fast-paced game, and the Kansas City – so after what we've talked about the game so far, that means Kansas City will host Buffalo next Sunday. That'll be at 7.40. The AFC game, 4 o'clock is the NFC Championship game. So Buffalo head to Kansas City um, where uh, Kansas City, you know, they're, they're a team that can have fans. So they, they've been having I mean, yesterday, if you watch the game, it seemed like there was quite a few fans there. So may see some people from Buffalo try to get some tickets and, and make that make that flight over. But Huge win for Kansas City. And then obviously this week on the podcast, I'll let you know the, the status of Patrick Mahomes and if he can play. I mean, that obviously 
that's the game there. I mean, if Henny, if Henny started a whole game, I, I don't give Kansas City much of a chance against Buffalo. So fun, fun game. And uh, Chad, you know, I've tried to channel my inner Tony Romo. So he was really fired up there on that last play. So Kansas City moves on. Cleveland, hell of a season for you guys. You get a playoff win, Baker Mayfield. I think you've really improved as a quarterback um, and, and the team itself. So kudos to Stefanski, who will likely be the coach of the year. Final game of the weekend, Bucks at Saints. Um, the two, the two elder statesmen. You get forty-three-year-old Tom Brady against uh, forty-two-year-old Drew Brees. Saints have dominated the Bucks uh, all year coming into the game. Um, the uh, the Saints thirty-eight to three win, and they also won thirty-eight twenty-three on opening day. However, I picked the Bucks, and I did that for a couple of really simple reasons for me. Uh, Drew Brees can't throw the ball down the field. I knew that before the game, and that was clearly illustrated yesterday. Um, I don't, he can't throw the ball, he can't throw more than 10 yards down the field. And they didn't have Latavius Murray, they didn't have Taysom Hill. But even with them, I wouldn't have picked, I was picking the Bucs. I think they're the second best team in the, in the NFC for some time now. In my power rankings, I had Green Bay and then Tampa Bay. So again, I'm just sticking with who I, who I think was the best teams. And it was a struggle early for Breeze and Brady. Both of them were god awful. Um, starts with a th- three and out for the Bucks. Saints do go on a field goal, get a field goal drive, basically based on their kick return, Deontay Harris, who had two huge returns in the game. But um, first two drives, Davenport's getting pressure on Brady. Demario Davis gets a sack. So two, two three and outs for the Bucks start the game. Um, Another field goal for the Saints, but you know, Drew Brees starts getting four for nine, 23 yards. He's just dinking and dunking. Um, he's throwing to his backs. He's, he's doing nothing, pushing the ball down the field. So it's, it's not a threatening thing. Um, but then we see Tampa finally have their first good drive on offense, 13 play drive. Fournette's getting the ball. He's getting some good uh, running lanes. Um, they're, Tom Brady's basically dinking and dunking too because there's not a lot open for him. And they get stopped in the New Orleans 7, 6-3. But prior to this drive, Drew Brees should have been picked three separate times. Carlton Davis dropped one. We saw Antoine Woodfield Jr. drop one. And there was another play, I forget, it might have been Devin White. He dropped one. And I was like, I just left my parents from supper. I was in the car. And I was thinking, okay, he's going to get picked because he keeps throwing the ball short and he's got a new alarm out there. Of course, my mother texts me in the car, uh, Tampa Bay interception. Yep. Makes sense. Throw picked off by uh, Sean Murphy bunting leads to Mike Evans, uh, three yard touchdown score, 10, six. And to really illustrate that Drew Brees couldn't push the ball down the field was this next play. It's a fantastic play. I'm not saying it isn't, but it just shows you how little confidence you have in your quarterback. We see Jameis Winston come on the field. He's lined up at wide receiver on the right side. You got Alvin Kamara basically in the wildcat. So they snap the play. Manuel Sanders comes from the other side. He flips the ball to Jameis Winston, who runs back in the middle. Winston throws 56 yard pass to Traquan Smith, who's wide open, who runs it in for the score. Now it's a fantastic play. If it helps you win, great. But the fact that you need to resort to a trick play tells you how little promise that they have in in Drew Brees throwing the ball down the field. Quarterbacks that need trick plays are guys like Mitch Trubisky, like the Jacksonville, Mike Glennon, bad quarterbacks. And that Drew Brees is a hall of famer. I'm not shading him here, but when you're not what you, what you were before, it's so evident here, you know, it's just, it's clearly obvious and it's, it's not fun to watch for Drew to go through that, but a big play. Jameis Winston comes in. We haven't really seen him play all year. Throws it on target. They get a score of 13-10. Um, but we see Tampa Bay continue to struggle on offense. You know, they're one for six on third down to start the game. Brady, you know, he's getting some drops. Gronk's dropped two passes at this point. Godwin dropped one. But um, they 13-10, they go on a drive to end the half, 13-13 at the half. So they're all – it's a close game. Um. No, uh, we see a 10 play drive from the, from the saints. They're chugging along. They, they get, um, they get a 
pass from to Traquan Smith from Drew Brees, 16 yards, touchdown. His second touchdown of the day, so big play, 20 to 13. But uh, Tampa's forced a punt. So again, they're struggling. On offense, when they had to generate it for, and dr- go down the field effectively, they, ha- they didn't do it all day. But what, what did it was turnovers. That was the game. Drew Brees on third down throws a good pass to Jared Cook, picks up the first down. Antoine Winfield Jr., he, great play in the ball. Cook's a big guy. He's got the ball, but Winfield Jr. wouldn't give up on it. Punches the ball out. It's recovered by Devin White. Second Saints turnover in the game. That's turned into a touchdown. Uh, Leonard Fournette, seven-yard touchdown reception, 20 to 20. Two turnovers for the Saints at this point equals 14 points for the Bucs. That's killer. That's killer. Um, we get a punt. Then we get another uh, – we get a 23-yard uh, field goal. We get a 17-yard field goal for the Bucs. They go decent drive for, from Brady's first good one. This was the game. We get about five or so minutes left. Drew Brees looking for Alvin Kamara. Didn't read the play right. He's picked off by Devin White, who was really the MVP. Three pass breakups, an interception, sack, three quarterback pressures. He was all over the field. He looked like the stud that they drafted two years ago, and he played like it yesterday, like a bat out of hell. Um, they drive, they get third, another pick, two picks for Drew Brees, three turnovers. And of course, Tom Brady, two yard quarterback sneak, 30 to 20, three turnovers, 21 points for the Buccaneers. And that's game. That really was it. I mean, I could elaborate more, but you turn the Tampa Bay was terrible on offense. Tom Brady threw for 200 yards in the game, two touchdowns, but guess what? He didn't turn the ball over. And that was it. Drew did. Drew threw another pick for the end of the game. Um, four, three, three picks in the game. And I'm just going to talk about Drew for a minute. Uh, I have a lot of, I love Drew as a quarterback. He, um, however, he had three picks. They look really bad in this loss. It was an embarrassing one for him. I think he'll retire. He said last night he still wants to think about it. He should retire. My advice to him is, retire drew like you're going to be a first ballot hall of famer you won a super bowl you changed the city of new orleans really the way what you did after katrina and everything that you did to rebuild that football and that community is you'll have a place in new orleans forever you won't have to buy a beer but you can't play anymore at a high level he can play i'm not saying can't play but for a guy like Drew, the, uh, playing at this age, the only goal is to win the Super Bowl. They've lost three straight divisional rounds the past three years. The Saints have lost in the same position every year. And I don't see it getting any better. Three picks in this game. He's underthrowing guys. He only threw for 135 yards. It, it's just time. And the Saints really, I, if you had a gun to their head, I don't think they want him back either. I don't think they want him back. They lose 30 to 20. Him and Brady shared a special one after when they're out of their paths, you know, all showered up after the game, a big hug. Obviously they have a, such a level of respect for one another. But Brady didn't play great yesterday, but he was good enough. And he goes to his 14th, 14th conference championship game in 21 years. It's pretty damn impressive. I still don't think he's the GOAT, but it's pretty damn impressive. Um, but for Drew, great career. I, I hope this is it because I really don't want him to see him come back and struggle more, which I think will only happen with his injuries and his ribs and his arm isn't great right now. It's time. So just, just you know, sail off into the sunset, Drew. You've had a great career and just enjoy it with your kids and your family. But w- with the Bucks win, they will head to Lambeau and play Green Bay. So it's Tampa Bay, Green Bay, Buffalo, Kansas City, both rematches. Uh, Bucks beat Green Bay in week six this year, just destroyed them in Tampa Bay, 38 to 10. Um, and then Kansas City beat Buffalo earlier in the year as well. So both these teams, both these matchups have already happened. So the rematches were um, Green Bay's at home this time. So that's a little bit different, but um an interesting, interesting last four. Obviously, Tom Brady against Aaron Rodgers for the first time in the playoffs. So that's interesting. Two all-time greats will, will go head-to-head um, for bragging rights, in a sense, um, this season. 
And then you got Patrick Mahomes and Josh, hopefully Patrick Mahomes and, and Josh Allen, where we're two st- future stars of the game. And we'll see if Kansas City can get back to the Super Bowl or if Buffalo will will, will advance will advance there for the first time since since the mid-90s. So great football action. Uh, you know, a lot of drama, a lot, a lot of intrigue still left to come. The NFL is never short on storylines. So um I'll be talking this week uh, about the matchups this weekend, any new head coaching updates, things of that nature. So um, keep, keep it locked here on to the point and we'll be talking more football. NHL over the weekend, uh, just some interesting storylines for me. Um, the Leafs played Friday night. They didn't play great. They didn't look great. Um, the lack of effort was really clear. Um, not wanting to go to the corners, which has really been a key for them for, for years now. Um, but you know, Saturday they played their best game of the year by far. Uh, they controlled the play. Matt Murray really kept the game close for them. Jack Campbell wasn't great. He made 17 saves and 19 shots. I'm not going to praise you for, for doing that. Uh, but he was good enough to get the win, but you know, it's important. It's more important I thought they played the whole whole team. I thought played pretty well, uh, but what's more important is that you got to beat Ottawa. And the for for Toronto for it doesn't in this division if you're Edmonton if you're Toronto Winnipeg, you got to beat Ottawa. And they're a tough they're gonna be a tough out because they play hard and they never quit. And I give them a ton of credit for that. DJ Smith has installed that system there where everybody knows their role, they stick to it, and they play hard. But for like Toronto, you got to beat Ottawa. When you play them, you need that two points. And it's you're only playing your, your Canadian teams, so you gotta you gotta win. And good on them. Um, I thought uh, at the end of the game, I thought Mitchell Marner was trying to lose it for them with two really bad turnovers. One where he had an empty net, and he just kind of flipped the puck to the defense to get it set up again. Then he had the puck in the in the corner fires it in the middle of the ice and it's almost scored by Ottawa so stupid decisions there from him um who's usually a decent reliable player but a solid effort for Toronto um they'll play Winnipeg tonight so that's a good test I think I uh, that game be interesting for me because I think both of them are the two best teams in this division so we'll see um what what comes out of that um, also yesterday, Toronto put Jason Spezza on waivers, um, mostly a cap thing, but he did announce if he's claimed, uh, on waivers that he'll retire. He only wants to play for Toronto. I don't think he'll be claimed. And I assume, I think he'll play, he'll be at least uniform before the season's over again. Um, another big, uh, matinee yesterday was Washington Pittsburgh. This is an important game for me. Washington won the first two against Buffalo. Uh, Pittsburgh had lost their first two against Philly. Um, but Pittsburgh, you know, Tristan Jari has a tough start. He was pulled um, in Friday night's game against Philly after allowing five goals. They started Casey DeSmith uh, for Pittsburgh. But this is a good game. Um, I thought Pittsburgh had some good fight. They fought back when they needed to. It obviously ended in the in the shootout and the gimmick. But I liked, you know, Alex Ovechkin scored his first goal of the year. But for Pittsburgh, I think we saw – some creativity. We saw the uh, blue line get involved. Marcus Peterson score a goal. Um, Brian Dumlin get involved in the rush. Um, so I like what we saw there. I still like Washington's team a lot. You know, I've, I've been finishing first in the East. I think them and Philly are really the two, the class of this division, but you know, Tom Wilson, he's only played three games, but he's playing at the top of his game right now. Uh, um, I Nick Backstrom's had a really strong start to the season. I think Washington needs to improve their depth in the fourth line, third line. They can do a little bit better there, but you know, this is, this is two teams that are bitter rivals. They'll play again Tuesday. And it was another game that's really close. Uh, You know, Malkin and Crosby still finding some connection. I thought Evan Rodriguez, who's not playing with Sidney Crosby um, really played well yesterday. Um, I think he'll be a fit. He kind of reminds me of a Pascal Dupuis, obviously wearing number nine too. So there's that little resemblance, but He's a hard worker. He's, he does have some skill. Uh, and I think for right now, I think he works with Crosby and Gensel. Uh, I think still needs to find his game a little bit, but I, I still like Pittsburgh and Washington to both make the playoffs. I think they're, they're both veteran teams, but I like, they both have that playoff DNA. 
and they've been there, done that, and I think they, they both get there. Really, and then sat, back to Saturday, Edmonton's in trouble. Edmonton is in trouble right now. Um, their defensive plays, I mean, there's bad systems across the NHL. I've said that a ton so far. Theirs are beyond, they're so bad. Um, they have bad go- They have bad goaltending. Koskin and Smith, but Smith's out. He's on long-term IR. That means you miss a minimum of 10 games. So he, Koskin is likely going to have to start every game here. And he's been, he's shaky at best so far this year. They, Montreal goes into Edmonton Saturday night and lays a beating on them. Winning 5-1, scoring two power play goals. Jeff Petrie scoring two goals against his former team. Tatar adds a pair, so he's now got three in the year. But Montreal's not a team that's going to outskill you, but they have a lot of workers. Gallagher, Anderson, I put Suzuki. He's a 200-foot player. Petrie might be the most underrated defenseman in the NHL. Just, I mean, he got a good contract this offseason, but he's worth that money. Um, you know, Ben Sherratt is another guy who doesn't take shit from anybody. They... They have a working team, and I think that's the biggest thing. And when you play, you get five, and you have Carey Price in that, they win 5-1, you're going to win most nights. Uh, and for Edmonton, just defensive, defensively, they don't have Kleckbaum. You know, Tyson Berry's, and he's being relied on a lot to play big minutes. That didn't work out well for him in Toronto last year. They got you know, Caleb Jones. I think they got Ethan Bear playing way too many minutes. I think he's a good defenseman, but you're rushing him into that. Um, nurse is going to have to play a lot. And when you, when dry and McDavid aren't scoring, this team still doesn't score. They need to find that depth score and the depth touch in this lineup for them to really be contenders. And Kyle, the guy they signed Kyle Turris, he needs to find his game. He needs to find it quick because you know, Pooley RV has looked okay. He's looked quicker, but you know, Tourist, Pugliarvi, that line needs to produce something for this team because it can't just be McDavid, Dreisaitl every night because you won't win effectively. And let's be honest, McDavid, Dreisaitl have to make a better, a concerted effort to back check, to get back. They don't do it enough. And yeah, you can score all the points, but if you get beat in the first round or the return to play like you did last year against Chicago, then what's that? What's all those points worth? Nothing. Maybe you get a... You put a trophy in your trophy case for a hard trophy, but if you don't win the cup, well, that's what you're playing for. So Edmonton worries me. They play Montreal again tonight. It'll be interesting to see how they bounce back from that really poor effort, but they got a tough spot in net. I think their decor isn't great and their depth, again, depth scoring. You get Cassian playing with McDavid right now, and that's, you can do better than that. That's all I'm saying. I mean, McDavid's still the most gifted player in the NHL. So most nights you give them a chance just based on that. But Saturday, it wasn't even close. I mean, Edmonton was getting beat on every puck battle. Josh Anderson getting pucks to the net. You know, Tatar being there to, to score goals. Gallagher getting into those tough areas. And they have a lot of those guys that just aren't afraid to get their nose dirty. You know, uh, we saw Philip Deno beauty feed to Tatar. I mean, two goals on the point, so... Montreal, you know, they got three points of their first four games. They look strong. We'll see what they can what they can do tonight. Columbus, on the other hand, we talked about them last week about uh, Pierre-Luc Dubois wanting a trade. They started the season 0-2, losing a pair to Nashville. Um, Nashville, I still don't think, is a great team, so you lose a pair to them. Uh, it's not a great start. They play today against Detroit for Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King Day in the States. But... I think it's it's going to be contentious there. I don't think it's fun right now for Dubois or the team um, where they both know that that Dubois wants out. He's basically playing through his contract. But I worry about Columbus because I don't know if they can sustain it here, if they can keep it going. Um, Seth Jones is still there. He's obviously great, but they need some good goaltending. And maybe Dubois will kind of snap out of it. I don't think he's played great in his first two games. Um, hasn't really been a factor. But for him, if you want to trade out, you make your value even higher. Go out there and really show people, okay, like, this is what I can do. This is Pierre Luc Dubois. This is me in the bubble. This is me every night. And if you can help Columbus with that, it may help him get, get out of that situation quicker. So Columbus struggling. Uh, 
this, they're always going to be a team that struggles to score goals. And that's their thing. And, and they need Merzlikens, they need Corpusalo to, to be good, to be um, solid, solid net miners, because otherwise you're going to be in a tough spot. Because Cam Atkinson, he's a former, former 40 goal scorer, but he hasn't shown a lot yet this year. Like I said, Dubois has been quiet. You need uh, Felino score a goal, but you need those guys, you know, Liam Foodies to step up this year. You need younger guys on the roster to, in Mill Bemstrom to take take a take a step, and uh, but tough start for Columbus. Um, NHL, a lot of games today. Like I said, it's Martin Luther King Day. So Boston Isles at six. We got Columbus on, in Detroit this afternoon. We got Toronto, Winnipeg. Uh, we got uh, Winnipeg. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, Edmonton and Montreal. Um, so. A lot of hockey today, um, a lot of action in the NHL with uh, Martin Luther King Day. And then obviously um, just with the schedule, you only have so many days to play games with only two being on the schedule yesterday. Uh, Dallas Stars will start their season Tuesday night. So we'll see what they can do after all their, their COVID issues. So, uh, but the NHL's back's in full swing. There's games every day. So uh, I love it. Um, NBA, some quick notes before we wrap up today. Um, Kyrie Irving for the Brooklyn Nets has not returned yet. He left the team, like I mentioned last week, because he was stated for personal reasons. Then he was seen partying at a club with his first sister's birthday with no mask and drinking and a whole bunch of people. Then when, when Brooklyn was playing, he was on a, he was on like a zoom call for a, a Manhattan district attorney. So he was doing that. Uh, and while he was out, they, he, Brooklyn, uh, went all in and they acquired James Harden from the Houston Rockets. Um, and Harden played his first game with, with, with the, um, with the Nets on Saturday. It was just him and Durant. They looked fantastic. Just the two of them. That's without Kyrie. Harden had a triple double over 30 points. Kevin Durant dropped 45 in a win against Orlando, but I had them go into the finals before the season and they look, I mean, James Harden, he's one of the most, gifted players in the history of the NBA. I mean, he's, he is a ball hog, but he's averaged over 10 assists a game in his career. So he will pass the ball. And then you have Kevin Durant, who may be the greatest scorer in the history of basketball, just because he's seven feet, nobody can guard him. I mean, he can make, he can literally shoot from half court and, and put it in. And he can also, you know, beat you. I mean, his step back too is, is basically unguardable. I and mean, that's a, another shot where you think of the sky hook, you think of, of Kobe's fadeaway. This shot is is so tough, and the, the, they look good. Obviously, only one game, so grain of salt there. But, you know, Kyrie Irving's got to get back into the mix here um, to really see what this team is made of. But they're going to be a fascinating team to watch the rest of the year, just with all the chaos going around there. And, you know, while all this is happening, the Lakers continue to win. You know, they're 11-3 and three on the year. Uh, yeah, I think the Clippers, they're a 10 four, so they play good basketball as well. So some, some good teams out there, a lot of teams that are kind of still figuring themselves out, but I'd say the Clippers, Lakers, Nets, and Sixers for me have been the, the most consistent teams so far this year. And um, obviously Joel Embiid for the Sixers has been playing probably the best basketball since he, since he entered the league. Um, and then also close to home, the Raptors, you know, they're four and eight. They have one, two in a row, beating Charlotte Thursday and Saturday, close games. But it, we start to see a little bit of life from, from the Raptors. Uh, Chris Boucher has really been a godsend for them. He um, They started the year with Aaron Baines at center. Uh, they had, last couple of years, they had Serge Ibaka, Marc Gasol. Gasol left to go to the Lakers. Uh, they, Ibaka wanted to stay, but he wanted a two-year deal. They offered him one. He left for the Clippers where he got a two-year deal. So it started the year with Aaron Baines at center. He was a disaster. Couldn't guard anybody. Wasn't shooting well. He was removed. Then they go to Alex Len, who's really been a, a depth center his whole career. He was drafted high in the, originally in the first round, but hasn't turned out into a good player. He's was started a few games, but wasn't playing big minutes, struggling. He's removed. Chris Boucher has been with the roster for a long time. He's undrafted free agent, but He's a Canadian and he's playing well. He's really improved his three-point shot. He's through shooting over 35% from three. He's a, a guy who's undersized, but he works really hard. He can finish around around the basket. He's been rebounding, working on his offensive rebounding. 
But, he, you know, over the last three, four games, he's really been a catalyst in them winning because just with his effort, his enthusiasm has changed, you know, the, Raptor, the way the Raptors are playing and giving them a better sense of confidence, just knowing that Boucher is there, you know, he's going to put in the effort to, to give you a chance to win. So, yeah, Boucher, the Raptors pick up two wins in a row. Uh, Pascal Siakam starting to play better. They're four and eight, so they're still in the hole quite a bit. They need to figure it out here quick. Um, but they play the Mavericks tonight on TSN, so that, that's a, a big game. But, yeah, four, again, Martin Luther King Day, a uh, very important day, obviously, in history. And also um, with that, there's a ton of sports today uh, with the NBA playing from 1 till you know, 1130 tonight. So a lot of games, a lot of games today. Um, but, uh, obviously, like I said, Martin Luther King Day is a special day um, for – for the whole world and just remembering, you know, what, a, what a great man that, that he was. Um, but yeah, that was really the weekend in sports. Uh, a lot, a lot took place. Obviously uh, the NHL really back in the swing of things. I'm going to continue to touch on as many teams as I can. Um, I, I'm liking uh, the matchup. So I like, uh, I wish they put more afternoon games on in the weekend. That's one thing I'm complaining about, but um it's been fun. Uh, the NFL, only two weekends left of football, which is sad. You get the championship game this weekend, and then there's the bye week for the Pro Bowl, which there's no Pro Bowl this year. Well, COVID, the one thing is there's no All-Star games. I hate All-Star games, so I, I love that. All-Star games, shootouts, get all that junk. I don't need it. Like If you want little kids to go watch it, that's fine. Uh, I check out that weekend. But no, no All-Star games, none of that goofy bullshit, so um, but NHL, NBA, you know, football on the weekends is on every night. So there's going to be time to watch uh, the Australian Open. Um, they've had some problems just flying over a lot of people having COVID positive. I know uh, Bianca Andreescu's coach tested positive. So they're supposed to start February 8th. There's currently 72 players in quarantine after either getting COVID or being in contact tracing with somebody. But hopefully they can get that tournament off. Um, you know, it's obviously a good start to the tennis year and, and it's, it's a lot of fun. So if that happens, we'll be covering that as well here. So I um, hope you guys had a, a great weekend. I enjoyed, I enjoyed the show today. Uh, sorry for the a little heat at the beginning, but it's just something that's important to me. And I think that needs to be said, but I'll be back tomorrow with Seamus for uh, talking about episodes three and four of your honor. And, you know, there'll be a podcast uh, every day this week at some point. So Keep your eyes and ears open. I'll let you guys know what's happening on, on our social media channels. But and, until then, have a great day and we'll, and we'll talk soon.